Yo, Shortbox Nation, this is Botter, and I'm here to tell you right now that con season starts early this year with the return of Northeast Florida's premier anime, comic book, and sci-fi event, Collective Con. That's right, Northeast Florida's largest pop culture convention returns for its 10th year on March 8th through the 10th at the Prime Osborne Center in Jacksonville, Florida. 10 years of Collective Con, they're pulling all the stops out to make sure this is a can't-miss event. And the guest list they got going, don't even get me started on the guest list. I mean, they've got A-list celebrity guests and voice actors from some of your favorite movies, anime, and video games like Elijah Wood and Sean Ashton, Ray Park, Trisha Helfer, Ross Marquin, Max Middleman, and bo herself would be there, Katie Sackhoff. Tell me what other convention is giving you the opportunity to meet Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings, Darth Maul, and One Punch Man all under the same roof. Only at Collective Con. And if you're looking to get some of your favorite comics signed, or if you want to get an original sketch from some of the best comic artists in the world, well, you're in luck because there'll be plenty of comic and creator guests there, like DC comic artist extraordinaire Clay Mann, Harvey Award nominated illustrator John Taylor Christopher, Marvel and DC cover artist Chris Stevens, and acclaimed Star Wars author Timothy Zahn. They'll all be at Collective Con this year. And if you're looking to bring the family or if you want to make a weekend out of it, you're in luck because there'll be so much going on at CollectiveCon that weekend in the form of vendors, fan panels, video game tournaments, cosplay contests, after parties, and a bunch of fan events. You can purchase single and three-day weekend passes now using the link in this episode's show notes or by going to CollectiveCon.com to book your tickets and hotel. Buy your tickets now, and I'll see you at CollectiveCon, March 8th through the 10th. Now let's start the show. Ashley, what's the best uh, uh, costume or cosplay that you've ever seen? It doesn't have to be Halloween specific. Every Halloween party I've ever been to, like the costumes are never that great. <laughs> like it's always oh, someone damn. buying that like costume in a bag. Oh, like, like the, the copyright, before. like yeah. Wizard yeah. Boy, <laughs> Harry Potter ripoff <laughs> costumes. Those are awesome. Yeah, scarred Wizard Boy, erected fellow. <laughs> Say, like, the fast hog. Um, but I've been to so many conventions and just um I would say Megacon is like the cosplay convention that I've I've been to where I've just seen like insane stuff and half the stuff I don't even know what it is. Just like giant armor things that you can tell people just put like years into making. Um there's this one I think he's local. There's this one guy that does a really good Iron Man. Oh yeah, he is. I photographed him in uh, the Jaguars stadium before. Did you really? Is his name Ted? That's it. Yeah. Did he paint That's it That's all like, I know Jaguar about him. Colors? Did he paint it Jaguar Yeah, colors? he had the, the Jaguar Iron Man Is that some like, place in China made that for him? He, like, they designed it and made it. Keep it, uh, keep oh, it on my bad. low, Ed. Keep it on low. <laughs> That's American made. <laughs> That's Amer- okay. <laughs> exactly. Hey. Hey. Stark exactly. needs to save money too. It's about bottom line. Yeah, I'll, I'll, the uh, Alibaba Iron Man. Alibaba <laughs> wish. It's the wish Iron Man. Um, but yeah, when I met around. that guy, <laughs> yeah, he had like the full Iron Man suit, but no helmet, and he was like drinking a cocktail and like talking to like a hot lady, and I was like, oh. That's the Jacksonville Iron Man. <laughs> That's legit. He's really into the cosplay if he's drinking. He's an alcoholic, Tony Stark. <laughs> <laughs> what if you would have approached him and he'd be like, wait, I'm in an Iron Man suit? Oh, shit. Who? Who's Iron Man? How many? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is just my Friday night suit. <laughs> exactly. You should see what Saturdays is. I went to a show. I was at a show and a guy was like probably 10 feet tall in this Warhammer outfit. <laughs> And he's walking down the aisle and this little kid, like a little, little kid just looks up and starts crying. That's a good costume. <laughs> kid just starts crying. This is like autumn. <laughs> That's a really good game. Effective. <laughs> I do recall one, it might have been like my first game event. I had seen uh, this dude cosplay as Kratos from God of War. And it oh, was yeah. literally like the movie, like, I'm sorry, like the video game character jumped off screen and was grabbing a, a drink at the, this party. This dude was fucking ripped. I was like, come on, bro. Come on, man. <laughs> like, you could have just been you. And it would have been impressive. But, you know, you're cosplaying as Kratos got a war. Who let you in with those chains? I don't know if I want to see fat Kratos. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's gonna be the next. Uh, that's gonna be the. That's gonna be the third game. Is the Kratos, is oh, retirement I love Kratos. it. Kratos, Just overweight, yeah. retirement Slazy. Kratos. Yeah, <laughs> good stuff. All right, let's go ahead and bring in the intro music and get this show started. Oh, 
Short Box Nation, welcome to a special spooky episode. We've got so much frightful fun planned for you today. <laughs> Man, I crack myself up. I bet I'd kill at stand-up if you know what I mean. <laughs> No, but really, I should probably look into doing an open mic night or something. Who knows? That might be my calling instead of doing these cheesy intros. Anyways, let's get this show started. He just took C's job. <laughs> That's the machine. Just took his job. <laughs> Was that a DJ Elzebub from Straight Chilling? Great shout out! Great shout out, Corey. I, I only I could only wish to be. Uh, to to nail that down. Big shout out to see. Big shout out to straight chilling. Uh, this machine is worth every penny. Short box nation. How are we doing today? To all of our new friends joining us for the first time. My name is Bobber Milligan. Welcome to the Short Box Podcast, the comic review and talk show where we provide you with the best conversations about comics, culture, and more. This is episode three seventy one. Our spookiest one. Yet. I spent all morning loading up this machine, so you guys are about to hear it. You're going to play the Monster Mash next? <laughs> <laughs> no, Ashley's actually going to do that karaoke uh, oh, after BC. Can't wait. <laughs> Shortbox Nation, today we're carrying on a new tradition that we started last year around this time, and we're talking about horror comics. The crew and I will be spotlighting some of our favorite. Scary stories ever told in the sequential medium that we all love. So this episode is not for the faint of heart, but it's certainly one for the undead and all of those that worship its darkest denizens. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> MJ Thriller, come on, you can't you can't bring in the spooky season. Yeah, you brought Vincent Price back too. <laughs> <laughs> You can't bring in the spooky season oh, no. without hearing Michael Jackson thriller. <laughs> I almost got Corey spinach his drink almost. <laughs> Speaking of denizens, allow me to introduce you to the ones that reside on today's panel. In the studio, sitting next to me, is the Yuri Edmund Danzar. Oh, and calling in live from the seventh circle of hell is wow. the murderous matriarch to be, Miss Ashley Lanny Hoy. <laughs> what up, Ashley? Wow. Was... Hey. <laughs> Wolverine's uh, uh, call oh, sound okay. is the best I had on short notice. All right, bear with me. Y'all. Bear with me. And joining us this episode is a special guest co-host sitting in the fourth chair today. It's been a while since we had a, a fourth uh, member and a fourth voice on the show, but we're happy it's this guy right here. He's been a podcaster for the last two years, and he's a great friend of ours. And he's quick to remind you that the world is his burrito, yeah, and you're just yours. a and you're just a mushy, refried bean, lucky to live in it. Short Box Nation, we got Corey Torgerson on the show this week. Let's give him a round of applause, damn it. What up, Corey? What up, Corey? What up, what up? I want to suck your blood. Okay, you said blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep it a PG for the kids. Okay. You know? Corey, can I just say, I swear to God, in my show notes, I wrote that joke down at first. I was going to say, welcome to Show oh, Nation, I, I and know. I want to suck your blood. But even I was like, oh, that's way too fucking cheesy. <laughs> it's too low. That's too low. <laughs> I don't want to be an embarrassment to the mm. short box. I brought my long-handled hang- shovel today, man. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, how is everything going with the podcast, The World is My Burrito? How are you doing? It's good. It uh, took forever to get my last episode out thanks to moving and uh, technical issues on the computer end. Um, But I'm really looking like thanks to the growing uh, family that I have on the straight chilling end of things um, and like the growing interest in horror in general. I'm really looking forward to the uh, well, yeah, the rest of this month. I'm hoping to knock out a couple of things before the end of the month. Hell yeah. Corey, what I like about your, your show is just the range of topics that you touch on. I was looking at um, uh, what you've got in the docket these last couple of episodes. I know your most recent one is about is about Buddha, right? Like the book uh, Buddha, correct? Yeah, it's uh, Osama Tezuka's. There we go. And then the episode before that was about fucking Bioshock. And I just don't know. I mean, even in the, the world's best six degrees of Ashley Hoy, you can't make that <laughs> connection happen. So... <laughs> Bravo to you. All right. You're covering the topics you love, and, and, and I'm happy to see it. I appreciate it, man. And while we're on introductions and before we get started, 
on the spooky topics at hand, allow me to remind everyone listening right now that you still have a chance to win a $100 valued comic from us and our partners at the Short Box Comic App for free. I should have done the megaphone right there, but it's for free. All right, this is a free contest to win this comic book. We're going to give one lucky person a pristine copy of a 9.8 CGC graded Deadly Class number one, which would make for an awesome addition to anyone's collection, whether you're, you're just starting out collecting comic books or you've been collecting them for a while. Having a Deadly Class number one at, at this grade would be pretty fucking epic. Uh, it's free to enter in this contest, and the rules are very simple. Uh, but your window of opportunity is closing. We'll be announcing the winner on our Instagram this Friday, October 14th. So please don't waste any more time thinking about it. All right. If you've ever entered in any contest that takes place on you know Instagram or social media, you know how easy it is. You, you like a post, you share it, you tag two friends, and, and it's easy peasy. All right. So you could be doing the same thing. Click the link in the show notes to enter in this free contest. And a big shout out to our partners at the Short Boxed Comic app. It is the app that is making it safer and easier to buy and sell graded comics online. Short Box is available on iOS and Android devices. So check them out. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I think I got one more. I got, I got one more shameless plug and we'll get started. I want to shout out a Short Box listener that goes by the name of Jason Barnes. Not only has Jason been a faithful supporter for years now, but he's probably got the highest IQ out of all of our listeners. I'm sorry, mom. I know you're listening, but look, Jason's Whoa. got everyone beat, all right? He is the first person that has ever used the discount code that I place in the show notes every episode. And it's probably the most obvious discount code of all time, considering I'm, I'm the one that made it. It's YO. It is just three letters, Y-O-O. But it gives people 10% off anything they buy from the short box store. So I want to give, give Jason a round of applause for being a financially smart shopper. You know we love some frugal some frugal uh, shopping. We love discount codes. The struggle is real. It's always been real. Shout out to you, Jason. And this is the part where I plug the short box store and all the merch that we have available for sale there. We got hats. We got shirts. We got pins. We even got 3D mini figs. All right. Click the link in the show notes to cop some merch and wear that shit. All right. Wear that shit out proudly out and about. We're on the topic of Halloween this week. Wear that shirt with our faces to a funeral <laughs> or, or rock the hat. Wear that shit. <laughs> Wear that shit. <laughs> so I was, channeling, um, I, was, I was channeling my best Samuel Jackson on that one. You know, Ed, how, how hype I get, you know, <clears throat> plugging, doing my shameless plugs. But wear that shirt with our faces to a funeral or rock the hat at your next seance, all right? You want to look fresh. They're not going to show up for if you're looking like a shithead. <laughs> Those ghosts ain't showing up. Talk to you. But like my favorite TV life coach likes to say, stop wasting your life not thinking about the short box. You're sitting on the couch, you're watching TV, and your life's passing you by. Exactly. It's just passing you by. Yeah, yeah, you got no fresh short box merch looking dusty. Come on, man. Go to the store. Anyways, with those very aggressive and spooky, remember the spooky part, <laughs> shameless plugs out the way, let's talk about the comics that will make you shit your pants. Oh, jeez. <laughs> a little too aggressive. Guaranteed. <laughs> There's a lot of shit in this episode. <laughs> wear, wear that shit while you're shitting in your pants. <laughs> Can't wait to see that on a shirt. <laughs> There's a reason we don't sell short box pants or shorts, all right? You just mess them up anyways listening to the show. All right. Today's assignment was each one of us was going to bring your favorite or new horror comic to share with everyone. So kind of like a spooky show and tell. Corey, you're our guest of honor. How about you go ahead and kick us off? What did you bring? Yo, this is Botter. Sorry for interrupting this episode, but I'll keep it brief. I wanted to let you know about a massive sale we have going on over at the Short Box Store on all of our merchandise and apparel. That's theshortboxstore.bigcartel.com. You can now save 20% off your entire order using the discount code YO, Y-O-O. So if you've been waiting for the right time to finally buy that gauntlet snapback, or if you ever wanted to buy any of the shirts you see me wear on the podcast, well, now's your chance to get them for a steal. We still have a few sizes left of everything, Thing, but they won't last long and once they're gone they are gone and then i mentioned that all of our apparel is screen printed on high quality material none of that heat transfer or direct to garment stuff our shirts are some of the most comfortable ones you'll ever wear and the hats look even better in person so wear your support for the short box nation proudly knowing that you're going to look damn good doing it get to the shortboxstore.bigcartel.com as soon as you can and don't forget to use that discount code 
Yo, Y-O-O, to save 20% off your entire order. All of this information can be found in this episode's show notes if you want to get there faster. Thanks for not pressing fast forward. Now back to the show. It was, it was too easy to pick Junji Ito, so I had to go off to something else. Um, I picked Blood on the Tracks, or Chi no Wadachi, by uh, Oshimi Shuzo. He's a pretty long-time running horror Japanese manga writer and artist. I picked this. It is a coming-of-age, ongoing still, started in 2017, um, psychological thriller uh, about a boy whose overprotective mother uh, straight up murders his cousin in front of him and then denies it to husband and family. Uh, and that's all just in the first volume. Um, there are currently 11 volumes out, and I finished up the 11th one uh, during the power outage. Um, but it is it is just very like mentally fucked up. Um, the mother is very controlling and it is uh i don't know i i read it and it's one of those that like i had a i had a good childhood but you can see how some people might not have had a good childhood is this one of those stories where you read it and you're like Oof, thank god i wasn't in that situation yeah <laughs> thank god my yes. parents loved me <laughs> <laughs> it is but it's it's definitely one of those like you know I, I i had a good childhood but it you know coming from a single home single parent home there were definitely stressors and uh, just remembering some of those moments where it's like, you know, my parent did something that like, yeah, this was a little over the edge. But then you read this and it's like, well, they didn't kill your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> didn't try to kill anyone. I guess if we're using that to compare childhoods, no one was killed in front of me. <laughs> oh, so it wasn't bad. It's, like, it's, yeah, it's not childhood. too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't I can't say too much. Like it, It's one of those that you can't really say anything without giving away some other major plot points. Um, it's very slow, uh, which is it. It works for it. How many volumes is it? You said you said 11 or you're just. So, at yeah, in, in the US, um, the 11th one just released. There are currently 13 in Japan. Is it done or is it still continuing? It's it's still ongoing. Oh, wow. So they're at I think 11 was like 98 uh, chapters, something like that. Um, it averages five chapters per volume. Yeah, it's it's extremely depressing um, and like just mentally horrific because it's very real. It's not supernatural in any way. It's like your Japanese bleak horror. <laughs> yeah, the uh, mono no aware is what they call it, where I mean, the only way that I can phrase it is that um, the bad is bad and the good is worse. Towards the end of it, the or the, the current end in the U.S. volumes, um, the main character, Seiichi, uh, takes this amazing step, like, you know, super lot of mental effort to do the right thing. And uh, it does not go well for him. And it's it's surprising like that. It's not visually surprising. Um, you know, it's just like, oh, my God, how can this get any worse? And then it does. So it's like more like a psychological horror more than like. Oh, yeah, it's it's, it's definitely not like, like deep... where it looks like a normal manga. And then there's like a guy with no. flayed and eyeballs and weird twisted up. No, nothing like that. About the only thing they do, um, which is, I think, even pretty normal in regular comics, uh, sometimes the art style will change based on whether it is a memory or it is the character like having a mental breakdown. Okay. Like the moment the cousin is pushed, um, he's, he's pushed over the edge of a cliff. And the moment the main character, Seiichi, sees it, like it's it's great because there's outlines of everything but then the shadows and stuff like that are all like squiggly lines so there's this beautifully like thin lined perfect uh you know art that goes into like squiggly lines and then as the character you start seeing things from his point of view as he's running through the woods to tell the rest of the family that his cousin fell off a cliff um like not that's I think the only time that you see everything warped, just that like visual, you know, the forest is warped, the trees are pulled to the side. Everything looks like it's shot through a fisheye lens, but those are also squiggly lines because he can't see things clearly. Corey, when, when you posted the um, when, when you added your item to the, the outline, I, I went and checked out the, the Wikipedia page. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like when it comes to manga, 
the more slice of life, and especially like I guess horror manga, like horror horror manga, the more slice of life the uh, cover is, probably the more fucked up it'll be. Because that was the most <laughs> slice of life cover I've ever seen. A little a yeah. beautifully, it looked like painted at that, like beautifully yeah. drawn mother holding, holding a adorable yeah, little I kid too. i was like oh this can't be that scary and then i read the synopsis and everything you said i was like uh, what the I thought fuck he was trolling us he's like parenthood is scary <laughs> right guys yeah <laughs> all right ashley will know soon <laughs> <laughs> so ashley read this and you'll uh you'll know what not to do as a mother <laughs> yeah great yeah, don't push your nephew off a cliff lucky we're in florida <laughs> don't worry about that no, I, that's true <laughs> but yeah the the first First cover art is watercolor, and even the first few pages are all watercolor. And that is something that um, is used a couple of times on and off throughout the series is watercolor panels. Um, I think it's because it is physically a lot easier to drown out the background. So when it's a memory, the background can be faded, but it's still really attractive to look at. And then there's crisp lines uh, like when he remembers being young, um, the mother is just like perfectly crisp, fine details, um, but everything surrounding them is, you know, watercolor. Kind of like Ed's point, you said there was like 11 volumes. You've already kind of caught up. And I know f- for me personally speaking, like when it comes to like very heavy psychological stories that are like, you know, meant to like, you know, not per se have a bunch of jump scares, but like the atmosphere and the uh, subject matters at hand is, is kind of heavy. I know for me, I usually try to find like a a, a break because it's just like, you know, if I read too much of that, it kind of just ruins my I'm in a weird mood the whole day. W- was that the case for you as someone that like thoroughly enjoys like kind of s- the more scarier stuff, horror things? Like, w- was it easy for you just to like plow through all 11 volumes or did it ever get to a point that you were like, let me take a break and go do some happy shit? <laughs> um, <laughs> not not as much as it used to be. I did like I burned through the first five volumes last year. Um, and then I finished six through 11 this past week. Um, the, my, my favorite genre is that like absolutely depressing. Nothing comes out positive. Um, it doesn't really like bother me. It's one of those that I like to see how different people, um, are they, is it, is it metaphorical? Are they telling a story like devil man cry baby? Um, if you haven't seen it on Netflix, absolutely amazing. But nothing nothing good happens everything good that happens results in something worse um but that's this metaphorical story of like you create your own demons and you have to live with it um but then you have like battle royale which is probably the oldest you know, thing that i've consumed um the lead characters survive at the end but like at what cost like what does it mean to live if that's the world that you have to be in where the government's just going to send you to kill your fellow classmates? Um, it's one of those that I've grown to love. And it's I feel like it's only in, you know, Japanese that because that is kind of a, a long, um, a very old type of storytelling is that everything sucks. Um, you know, the pathos of things. That's a trope. And I think as someone growing up reading like Western fiction, we're we're kind of programmed to look for either a definitive conclusion or at least a happy ending, or there's an optimistic, you know, feeling at the end. Whereas the Japanese do not subscribe to that <laughs> at all. At least a lot of the fiction and like, especially with devil man cry baby, which is probably the most, probably the best adaptation of going to guys cry baby, or I'm sorry, devil man. Um, and it ends the same way. It's the same, pretty much exact same ending. Yeah, it's it's bleak stuff for sure. I did an episode last year on Hellraiser. Um, so like that as well. Clive Barker has a lot of uh, you know, short stories or even long stories that are just like you fucked up and it's never gonna get better, no matter what you try to do. Like you can be a better person, but you made one mistake and now it's gonna haunt you for the rest of your life. Cannot wait to we. Can't wait to read this on this beautiful, <laughs> sunny Florida weather here soon. All right, Corey, we'll get back to you here in a second. I want to move on to uh, Ashley. I'm going to pass the baton to you. What was your uh, horror comic uh, for today? Um, so for this year, I uh, I reread the first four issues of Haro County, which was something that I was reading as it came out. Um, and I think it's it's been finished for about five years now. Um. But I I like it because it kind of has like a um 
like a Hellboy Black Hammer feel where it's just um, everything's kind of odd. Everything's kind of off. Um, and then you pointed out that I picked witches last year, which is funny because it's same. It revolves around like a witch and um, a big scary tree. It's uh, It sounds like it's a little bit more fun to read than <laughs> uh, Corey's <Yeah. laughs> A little more light, I mean. Which is funny because I think your covers are probably the most... Uh, um, I think they telegraph probably yeah, the best at, hey, this is some fucked up shit. You know, monsters. <laughs> <laughs> Arrow yeah. County's cover looks terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's about like a little... Well, she's 18 and the whole town thinks that she is like this reborn witch... Um, and her best friend is this little boy, except like, um, he's like his, he keeps his, um, skin and his body separate. So if she's in trouble, like this little skinless creature comes out and saves her. So that's really scary. And then she Not carries a around here. a bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she carries around a bag with just like this little dead boy's skin and he's like her friend. They like talk to each other, but somehow it's like, it's creepy, but it's also just fun it's just like hellboy it's just like lighthearted. and it's just quirky i think that's the word i'm looking for on the wikipedia i don't know what issue this is. it looks like maybe issue one is what they got for the image but they've got a little blurb from uh mike mignola on the cover of issue one and he, it looks like the quote is a rare thing both wonderfully charming and genuinely disturbing mike mignola which i think is Mm-hmm. Anytime you get a, first of all, if you oh, get yeah. a Mike Mignola like you know cosign, it's like yeah, you're probably doing something the right. Dark Horse probably makes him do it. <laughs> Promote this book, Mike. Come on, man. Like Mike, if you're not going to draw the interiors of Hellboy, you better give us. You some haven't drawn books. in 15 years. Come That's on. good stuff. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, Colin Bunn is a great writer. He does pretty much Super. everything. Yeah, he does really good work. That's actually an understatement. Colin Bunn literally writes, has written like every almost season. every title. I think he's still like, I think he writes 99.9% of DC titles now or, <laughs> or Marvel at any given time. And then, uh, Ashley, are you familiar with this? Uh, I'm not familiar with the artist, Tyler Crook, but it says here that he's known for like his work with, with Mike Mignola, speaking of which, on like BPRD and stuff. How is the artwork? That So that's the only thing that um, I know him from is some uh, BPRD stuff. Mm. Um, so the artwork's nice. It's... um. It's an example of good interior watercolor artwork Mm. Um, because I don't want to keep harping on this, but I've seen bad interior watercolor artwork. Um, There's a a right way to do it. And (laughs) this guy, he he does it well. It's quirky. Um, You can tell what's going on. He's got like really good lighting. Um, It's just the book is really fun. Even like it does have some really creepy little scary characters in it. But overall, I think um, like quirky and charming. Like those are my two words for this book. It doesn't sound like it's something like Corey's title where it's like very kind of slice life psychological. Uh, It sounds more like maybe maybe jump scares or or is it more like in the on the kind of like body grotesque angle? Like where, where do the horror aspects come in? It's more coming from like the the creature side cuz okay. there are panels where you're like looking into the woods and or you're looking into like darkness in a panel and then the next one something's like jumping out at you. Um but yeah, he does a really good job at like drawing all these little creatures cuz it's hard to get, you know, scared by something like an image, I guess, like a drawn watercolor image. Um You're like, "Damn, that you shit's know, beautiful." I find <laughs> <laughs> Um, like most of like the scariest things I've ever seen are like movies. So it's hard to get like a comic, like a bright comic to scare you. But there is some pretty creepy stuff in this. All right. Good stuff. Good pick, Ashley. Uh, Ed, let's go to you, man. What's what's your horror pick? uh, Okay. Charles Burns Black Hole. It is basically it started as a 12 issue miniseries, um, but it took him 10 years to do. And if you look at the art, you can see why. That's all ink. Damn. <laughs> he uses more black ink camera. than oh, anyone I've nice. ever seen. Jeez. Um, I don't know how his paper doesn't buckle. That's how much ink he uses. Um, but the, the what attracted me to this is like, I got the single issues here too, like these covers. And uh, it was, I think I was going to Universe at the time and I just saw the cover and these came out so sporadically. Like, you know, I kind of was starting to collect them kind of more than halfway through the run. So anytime I would see an image, you know, I would order it or if I see it on the, so, but it came out so infrequently, I forget what I have. I just see black hole on the shelf, grab it. So I got 
like doubles <laughs> of like five or six of these issues. But then they came out with this really nice hardcover a few years ago. Um, but like I said, it switched from Kitchen Sink Press to Fantagraphics. And like I said, this guy, this is, this is 10 years of someone's life doing this book. But fret not, this guy's a pro. Like Vodder said, he was a professional illustrator. So this wasn't what he was, you know, he wasn't relying on this to pay the bills. This is his hobby. <laughs> this was his hobby while he was doing you know, work for like Altoids and Coca-Cola and <laughs> magazine. You know, he's, this guy's like a pro's pro, That's wild. but he started in, you know, underground comics, like with uh, Art Spiegelman, Dan Klaus, that kind of era of artists. I think I can read the back. I think it kind of, kind of gives you a good idea. So it was like a horrible game of tag. It took a while, but they finally figured out it was some kind of new disease that only affected teenagers. They called it the teen plague or the bug. And there were all kinds of unpredictable symptoms. For some, it wasn't too bad. A few bumps, maybe an ugly rash. Others turned into monsters or grew new body parts. But the symptom symptoms didn't matter. Once you were tagged, you were it forever. Bars. Mic drop right Ooh. there. So Real quick, can I also yeah. say, because uh, Corey and Ashley kind of feel it, but Ed's phone was going off the entire time he read that, vibrating. And it only added to the suspense of you reading that. I was like, what the fuck's going on at the house? Get that haunted book out of here, Ed. It's cursed. It's cursed. I, I, was, I was like, is that a phone word? Like, it's not mine. I checked my own phone. I'm like looking around like no one is reacting to this. And so you yeah, basically follow the like Chris and Keith are the two main characters that kind of split off and they're kind of basically dealing with his disease. And it's easy to kind of say this is like an allegory for, you know, AIDS or for an CD or something, but it's this book, this takes place in the probably mid to late seventies when Charles Burns was like his age. So he's smart that he writes, he writes kids when he was a kid. Like sometimes it's awkward reading, like, you know, even like Kirby will write for kids and it's like, that's some funky beans, you know, it's like, what the <laughs> fuck? You know, it doesn't, doesn't make sense, but he's smart that he wrote, a book about teenagers in a time when he was a teenager. So it makes, you know, makes a lot of sense, but the disease is kind of the backdrop. It's a, it's more of like a character study, how these kids are. So basically like, like the, that, that tag said, so some people get like a weird rashes or stuff that they can cover up so they can still go to school and still kind of live their life somewhat normally. But other kids get really messed up. You know, their faces get all messed up. They get large lesions and things like that. It's a lot of body horror. I guess if we're going to do the uh, if, you know, X met Y type of thing, it's like, I guess if, uh, you know, David Lynch did Dazed and Confused <laughs> with a little Stephen King in there. Um, because, like I said, they don't really, the disease is there, but they don't talk about what caused it. They don't talk about how to treat it. That's really kind of the backdrop. So a lot of these kids end up living, and this takes place in like Seattle and Pacific Northwest area. So these kids who are really messed up looking, they end up living in kind of like in the woods, kind of almost like a leper colony. So they're kind of hiding out in the woods. There's these weird little totems. And then this kind of, these murders start happening. It's a very critically praised book, but I think a lot of people will just kind of see the premise and write it off. Oh, this is a book about AIDS you know, and not really give it a shot out. The, uh, the artwork is stunning. Like let all that white, I've seen some of the original art like online and he's not using any white marker or white out pen. This is all black and white. So it's all heavily penciled. And then that's why it took him, you know, 10 years to make 12 issues, <laughs> how meticulous this style is and how consistent it is throughout the thing. So, and it's pretty much this, what I, what I like about this book too, is it has everything I don't like in a comic. It's about teenagers who gives a shit. Um, you know, it, <laughs> oh, man, there's, man, man. <laughs> there's, there's a ton of talking heads in it, which I always criticize comics having. Um, there's no supernatural twist to it. It's, you know, it's basically like kind of, like you said, it's a slice of like, kind of like what your, what your, what your pick was, Corey, where it's mm -hmm. nothing really supernatural no real big action sequences a lot of crazy imagery where you get that lynchian kind of bizarre surreal imagery but no real action things splash pages nothing terribly exciting happens but there's this dread 
throughout the whole thing. The way it's drawn, all the black that's used. So when there's like a day scene or when they're, it's like, oh, wow, this is okay. It changes the mood in just two colors, no grayscale, no, no even little cheap little pops of color to kind of, you know, oh, this is what I'm trying to say. Not even like the scratch marks. It's just no. like solid. They're, the only yeah. thing that scratch marks is, is he meets a, one of the love interests, her room is full of her artwork and it's all like basically paste up, but of his sketchbook. So like, mm-hmm. there's like a scene, I'll find it and I'll send it to you, but there's a scene with, she has all her artwork on pasted on the wall and it's like, there's different styles, but those were all basically photocopied and kind of pasted on the actual page. Hmm. So those weren't drawn okay. on the page. So they were basically like pasted up uh, if you know what I'm saying. So that's yeah, the only time okay. you really see a difference in style when it's an actual piece of art within this world so everything okay. is consistent sometimes he'll use these wavy wavy uh, border panels to kind of as like a time shift or a memory or a hallucination or a bad dream or a bad drug trip so a lot of sex a lot of drugs in this um but nothing i would consider exploitative or like you know just gross or you know it's not exploitation it's just it's just in there it's part of the story but if you have aversions to, you know, pubic hair and penises drawn, it might not be the book for you. Um, <laughs> but like I said, it's very, and the dialogue is so straight and like how, and I think if you were a white suburb kid, you'd probably know people like these. Because this is kind of where it takes place. This isn't. I guess I can't read it. You know, <laughs> I know white people. But there's like the drug, the college burnouts that, you mm. you know, you'd go buy weed from. You, these are people that at a certain time in your life you oh. may or may not have met. When I first know. joined, uh, for when I first started hanging out in Riverside, got it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, those guys. <laughs> I was going to say when I lived in Riverside, <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll double down on that. And it, it is bleak throughout the way, throughout the whole way. And the ending is very ambiguous. You're not really sure. One set of characters, you kind of see there's some hope, but they're just an uncertain hope to it. The other one, I don't know. It's kind of leaves it up to, in the air, whether it's the end of that life or it's just, you know, thinking what to do next. What's the next step. So I think the allegory for the, uh, the disease is more adolescence because this only affects, you know, teenagers in this world. So I think the allegory is more not AIDS, not STDs, but it's just kind of that awkward transition from, being a teenager to adulthood and how weird and you don't know what you're doing. At least I didn't. And I think a lot of people don't, but no direction. You're not sure what's going on. And then that kind of, I think that represent that. And another cool thing too, is in the book, he does these yearbook pictures of the kids. And I'm thinking this was his yearbook when he was a kid, he's drawing portraits from this yearbook. So this is a really well drawn book. So one page is like the kids normal. And then you see the kids affected by the disease on the uh, in the back page so it's like and even him check it out this is him now and this is him as a kid with that with yeah, fro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this reminds me of, like i'm getting like hernandez brothers oh yeah um uh love and rockets and a little bit of like mike alred too something about how like flat everything is a flat, how clean yeah yeah, yeah and like perfect the line is and he's like in that group too like i said i think they're pretty much contemporaries i think alred and him but you can see there's some influence going, going that way. But this is he hasn't done too many, too many books. He's done a handful of other ones because he does, like I said, he's got other things he's doing. <laughs> but um, like I said, this has been, I think, why I like this so much, and this is kind of on my top five of all time. Damn, is because it has everything I wouldn't normally seek out in a book, but it's done so well that I love it. You know, it's that's what I always come back and I always read it. And I'm always like, how did this guy how long did it take him to draw this? Because everything he draws from even just foliage or even just like an ashtray with cigarettes, it's like, man, this is incredible. So, yeah, if you haven't seen Charles Burns art, man, just check it out. It is it is it is probably the best brushwork and inking I've ever seen. That is one hell of a presentation, Ed. Uh, And I'm glad you explained the story because I've seen this image, this cover. uh, um the, the cover for the trade and hardcover, like everywhere. At one point it was like, like you said, in a lot of like best of lists, I think it was in a lot of like solicitations. And I think for me, the, the cover 
fooled me. I thought it was like a, um, I thought it was about like a serial killer or something, like a Dahmer series or something like that. Mm. So I would not have that guessed sense. that because I, I don't know because it looks like a victim. Yeah, yeah right. Like, like yeah. anytime that you've got like a portrait of someone on on the cover with their eyes uh, blacked out or covered up, it's like, nah, that, that's some serial killer. Yeah, I think shit. the covers do, but imagine seeing like a cover like this. Yeah, I didn't. Then know they you're came like single issues. That's fucking. Wild. You're like, oh, what is going on here? These are just stunning, and like even the color ones. It's just like very flat colors, but it's so much detail. It just really pops. Ashley, do you remember? Um, do you remember? Do you recall seeing this cover around when you were uh, working at the shop or anything? I feel like this was like I one remember of those seeing books. it, but I I never picked it up because I do remember it. Just you never knew when the next one was going to come out. Yeah, so sporadic. Good stuff. <laughs> All right, so Ed, you took us back to like more of a grounded reality, uh, uh comic book story wise. I'm going. Uh, full to the other side this one is, is a lot more I, I think on the supernatural angle and maybe one that i i don't know you know our short box listeners i don't know if they would have expected this one from me so i was almost gonna pick that one really yeah okay good stuff I, this was <laughs> all right so let me just introduce my series the horror comic that i'm um spotlighting today is afterlife with archie it was the 2013 series uh, written by Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, with art by Francisco Francavilla, um, obviously uh, published by Archie Comics. Ed, much like 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 you said, um, I guess this isn't a normal comic I would have read, but I think because of that and my expectations not really being there, it was a pleasant surprise. It is like it was amazing. It was a really good fucking book. I recommended that for a while and people would laugh at you. Was, they scoffed yeah. at you. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I thought the same thing, but I like, you know, Francesco Francavia. His art's so cool. And it's, and I saw it. I was like, this looks pretty. I thought it was like, what is this cheese rock? Yeah. I, I thought it was like some, <laughs> like one of those, like Archie meets Punisher. Archie yeah, meets Archie meets, yeah, yeah. Something yeah. like that. It's like, but no, I've read so many good reviews. So many people, talked about it i finally broke down and got the trade yeah it's, it's like this is the best horror comic it of the is year. incredible <laughs> um before, before I, I i really get into the, what it's about actually have you have you read this i read the first um trade paperback of it i liked it a lot and you were so fucking scared you decided never to revisit mm. it i don't blame you <laughs> little cry baby <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding well i'm not gonna lie when i saw the title just the title i was like man uzumaki scared botter into like baby <laughs> comics <laughs> <laughs> it's like never again never He's again traumatized jinji ito traumatized him. <laughs> i want like um drew shortly after that uh my little uh, Junji Ito infatuation phase, which lasted maybe like two weeks because I was just scared out of my mind. He found a <laughs> like hardcover art book and he was like, hey, man, I know you're really into Junji Ito right now. I, I found this uh, book. You want me to grab it for you, bro? And I was like, yeah. yeah, hell yeah. Get that art book. I flipped through two pages of that art book and closed it forever. <laughs> it, that was even more fucked up. It's on whatnot, guys. And, Next whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> go cheap. From my personal this collection. Cursed image. Cursed book is going cheap. <laughs> All right, but back to our, uh, Afterlife with Archie. Um, Corin, Ashley, I, I shared the um, uh, image for reference in, in the chat. But Afterlife with Archie, like I said, it was a 2013 series, 10 issues in total. It was collected in two uh, trade paperbacks, divided into two volumes. Uh, and the idea came out of a just a random variant cover that uh, Frank Avelli did for Life with Archie number 23, which was released in 2012. It was just a, a, a variant B cover. And when you look at the original cover for Life with Archie number 23, it is like a, a world of difference. I think the regular cover is like Archie playing a guitar and, you know, Jughead, what a girl, and Betty and Veronica. Like they're your usual Archie covers that come to mind when you think of the company and the comic. But this variant depicts a group of zombies led by zombie Jughead, like, you know, slowly uh, approaching Archie in a graveyard. And it's like classic kind of comic book cover. There's a word bubble of Archie, you know, saying something like, what's going on? Whoa, hopefully, you know, something like that, right? So this cover was met with such positive reception that I, I believe the, um, I think CEO or, or the editor in chief, I think a much higher up position than editor in chief, but the CEO of, of Archie Comics had, uh, I think the story goes like, he was having lunch with Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, who has worked on like Glee. I think he's like been a showrunner and a writer on shows like Glee, Riverdale, a few C other CW things. Um, oh, uh, the sexy Archie. <laughs> Yeah, so like <laughs> Roberto has had experience kind of in this like in this world and and also in comics as well, and they're trying to like brainstorm like you know new ways to um, new ideas for Archie, 
And they were looking at this cover, and I think Roberto was like, yo, imagine a story, like an expanded story just based on this cover. Like, just imagine building a story based around this cover of Archie and Zombies. And uh, I think the next day he got a call from the CEO. Uh, I think his name is John uh, Goldwater. And he was like, go for it. Whatever you had in mind, go for it. And that's how we get to um, Afterlife with Archie. And for those of you that, that haven't read it, might be scratching your head what it's about. It was a 10-issue series split into two volumes. The first volume is called Escape from Riverdale. And the synopsis for that is uh, after a car driven by Reggie kills Hot Dog, who is Jughead's dog, Jughead asks Sabrina to bring his beloved pet back to life. She does using some very, you know, crazy dark arts. Necronomicon. Yeah, Necronomicon. Yeah. <laughs> of course, this has terrible consequences because Hot Dog becomes a zombie. He bites Jughead, who instantly becomes patient zero and then helps like start and spread this zombie virus and contagion. And now it's like post-apocalyptic and fucking Riverdale of all places. Pet cemetery. Yeah, yeah. Zombies, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then volume two kind of continues that story, but more so um, weeks after Archie and a, a very small band of his friends leave uh, Riverdale and like they're, you know, going along a deserted high. It's basically like Archie meets Walking Dead. They're on deserted highways trying to stay one step ahead of the zombie horde that is being run by Jughead. It's it's epic. And they do a spinoff, uh, Sabrina gets a spinoff because of she gets punished for using the ne- Necronomicon. Yeah. Her shenanigans in it. I haven't read it, but I, I've heard really good things about it. And that's but. a series that I, I started reading and, and loved it. But I was like, man, I don't know why she got her own series. So commentary wise. So you got like two ingredients and they're both like very familiar tropes. You got Archie on one hand, which is small town USA slice of life, like teen romance comics from the forties. That is, you know, I think it's like the biggest brand when it comes to like teen romance comics that's still around to this day it's crazy and then you got zombie apocalypse story on the other and at first you're like these two things just don't <laughs> fucking go together it's a little confusing when you kind of like hear the premise at first but when you actually read it i mean it, it it just ends up being like this seamlessly blended like thing this new thing it's like almost unrecognizable from its like original components it is so like seamlessly brought together and, and makes so much sense this new world that they build yeah and i think that what makes it works because i think anyone who has read any comics has probably read an archie comic come on absolutely so you know your mom has characters. picked it up from you at the grocery store it's like kind of like superman <laughs> even no one who knows reads comics they know superman he was an alien. They know Batman's yeah. folks were killed. They know Archie and it has like Betty and Veronica going after his weird ginger <laughs> ass. No one knows that. And the Jughead likes his hamburgers or hot dogs. Loves his right? hamburgers, but still skinny. So, I mean, it starts out as like a straightforward zombie story akin to like Shaun of the Dead or 28 Days Later. And then, uh, like Ed was kind of alluding to, they start pulling in characters from the larger Archie universe that, you know, I personally kind of forgot about. I forgot that, like, Sabrina Teenage Witch is kind of in that universe. Josie and the Pussycats. Like, they pull in these ancillary characters into this world and use them as vehicles to, like, tell even more, like, fa- like introduce more fascinating plot lines to the this Afterlife with Archie story. And they pay homage to, like, you know, other great horror media like H.P. Lovecraft, you know, um, at some point, like, you know, spoiler warning. Sabrina, the teenage witch, you know, her punishment is that she ends up becoming the bride of Cthulhu. Like, it's it's a crazy fucking issue. But they also have issues that pay homage to, like, The Shining and the interview with a vampire. Um, the art, to me, isn't always perfect. Like, some panels and pages aren't, like, perfectly drawn. Um, and that might just be, like, my own, uh, definitely my own personal taste. And I think there's some inconsistencies. But it's one of those stories that you, after you finish reading it, you can't imagine anyone else drawing it. Like, I would be upset if they ever had, like, a fill-in artist. Frank Avella, like, he was made to 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 draw this. And the colors are are really good, too. I, I wish I would have grabbed the name of the colorist, but um, they evoke, like, this 70s classic horror feel. You got, like, a lot of, um like, atmospheric colors, like purple, orange, and reds. And it makes, like, this world unique. It makes it really believable and disturbing as hell. Like, it's just legit disturbing. It's very existential, too. And it's, like, it's existential, but also, like, really tongue-in-cheek. There's, it's, like, really funny, man. It's, like, really dark humor that's funny. And Archie is just, like, you're watching, like, this slice-of-life American, like, do-good kid. Like, you're watching him become, <laughs> like, a hero in the middle of, like, this zombie apocalypse. And you kind of feel for him because they're all teenagers watching their best friend become like monsters and civilization falling apart. And there's still like the love triangle that you see between, you know, Betty, Veronica and Archie. And then some of the other characters have their own things going on. I I couldn't put it down. My only gripe is 
that I'm now part of the sucker nation that is eagerly waiting for the conclusion. They put out 10 issues, uh, and the last issue came out in 2016. They have not released 11 and 12. They haven't like finished it yet. Art does exist for the covers, but there's no release dates. They haven't been published or anything. It's fucking maddening. It's like, is this part of the story to make me goddamn mad? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I loved it. I, I loved it. I cannot recommend it enough. And if I had to do the um, you know X meets Y formulization, I think I'll just kind of stick to what I had, which is um, it feels like all those things. It's Shaun of the Dead meets 28 Days Later meets H.P. Lovecraft meets Interview of the Vampire meets Dawson's Creek of all things. Oh, meets Riverdale. <laughs> is that too easy? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I did have some interesting facts real quick because I just went down this like archy rabbit hole. Like, I forgot how much I was reading, like, Saturday morning cartoons and those type of comic strips early on when I first got into comic books. So they were more accessible and mm-hmm. available to me than, say, like, going, telling my, convincing my dad to go to the comic shop. Yeah. Or you could cry in the grocery store and they'll just give you Archie <laughs> and shut you up. <laughs> so Afterlife with, Afterlife with Archie was the first comic from the Archie line to be sold directly to comic shops versus newsstands, and which was kind of mind-blowing and, and impressive. Like, I think I forgot that, oh, shit. Archie Comics is still primarily a newsstand market comic. You can't really find them in, in comic shops unless maybe you order them. They're you know meant to be sold in a um you know spinner rack at a. This was a, a big shot in the arm for the company. For sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It is also the company's first title not to be aimed at children. It is rated teen plus. Um, at issue eight is when they decided to put a um, an Archie horror logo, which spawned its own Archie horror imprint, and they've published other kind of horror themed Archie comics like. Like the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, Vampironica, which is the vampire of Vampirana. Awesome. <laughs> and then they got a whole bunch more. Is that what she is? <laughs> I never picked up on that. Yeah, that's pretty funny. And, and lastly, they both have uh, the same hair. Archie Comics was following the Comics Code of Authority standard up until 2011. I can't recall when Marvel and DC and some of the other ones like finally, you know, did away with it, but I know it was well 90s. before 2011. Okay, so up until, what is that? 11 years ago, Archie Comics <laughs> was still following this very kind of like outdated uh, uh, standard system. And I don't find it a coincidence neither that once they drop like that outdated censorship standard, that you get this masterpiece. Mm-hmm. I think there's something very poetic and maybe like very something to be said about like dropping censorship and just kind of embracing you loosen the grip and you get more creativity. Yeah. You know, you loosen your guidelines up. Yeah. So I, I loved Afterlife with Archie. It is like genuinely disturbing. Just. Because you're seeing very familiar characters that you associate with, like, feel good, and they're get, they, they could do nothing wrong. And you're seeing them in these positions, you're like, oh, shit, you got to, like, really feel for these guys. So, um, yeah, it was shockingly good. I was like, shockingly this good? Is good. <laughs> Scream, frighteningly good. Uh, spooky season, after all. This is one that you would you could give someone that is like, I love this time of year. I love Halloween. I love getting in the mood. Every day I want to read some, you know, horror comic. This is what I would definitely recommend. Um, and, and with that being said, I wanted to um, I wanted to go back to, to Corey real quick. And, and as far as blood on the tracks, Corey, I was curious to hear your like, you know, X, Y formula slash recommendation. Like, how would you describe your comic to someone? I would combine this. Um, the Babadook meets V.C. Andrews flowers in the attic. Um, so the Babadook, the film, um, I love that because it's like metaphorical for living with depression. It's a great example of like a mother son dynamic, um, that's like not working. And it is, uh, more so in the case of the mother is the yeah, actually don't watch the working. Babadook. <laughs> that movie's so depressing. Oh, you already watched it. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> Dang it, man. <laughs> And then VC Andrews Flowers in the Attic is uh, I recently listened to the audio book, uh, but like 70s or 80s horror. Um, But it kind of comes down to a mother that just does not give a shit about her children. Um, They literally have to live up in an attic um, in a mansion uh, for a couple of years. Um, It's one of those that it's like, it seems like the mother cares, but it's all lying. And a lot of that goes hand in hand with Mm -hmm. um, like blood on the tracks. Uh, Whenever the son tries to, when he does everything the mother says, it's not right. When he doesn't do what the mother says, it's not right. When he hangs out with someone, they're the wrong person. Um, But it's just this like constant oppression. And VC Andrews is kind of like that. Where like, no matter what the kids do, you know, the mom 
that mother is a little more of a, a lying piece of shit, but you know, for the most part, it's like, mm, I mean, that was okay, but you know, so yeah, uh, the Babadook meets VC Andrews flowers in the attic. Ooh. If you've ever read that novel, good stuff. Ash, I'm going to go to you. What other Halloween related media are you going to be consuming for the spooky season? <laughs> I have, um, I actually, I have a list of, so I like scary movies, but I have five movies every year that are like always on the list. Ooh, come on, um, Ashley. You know, we, you know we love a good, uh, <laughs> you know we love a good buzz list. Mm. All right, so Trick or Treat. Oh, it's okay, yeah. That's, That's going to be in theaters. That's a Halloween movie. That's going to be in theaters for, re-released in theaters for a couple of days. Cool. Yeah. I got to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> um... Beetlejuice. Okay, classic. Is okay. classic. Um The Old Dawn of the Dead. Mm. Um oh. Shaun of the Dead is probably oh, my favorite one. one. And then last one, um every year we watch Young Frankenstein. Oh, <laughs> classic. That's a good you got some range on that one. What actually. a good pick. I like that. <laughs> hey, what about you, man? What what are you going to be uh, consuming for the Halloween season? Um, usually I will brains. <laughs> I will... <laughs> <laughs> you left that note in. One of my favorite artists who does kind of creepy stuff is uh, Richard Sala. Um, so I usually I have a handful of his books, and I got one that was released after he passed. Um, I think a year or two ago. So I need to actually sit down and read that one. But his stuff I usually go over, like Richard Corbin. I kind of have like a eerie like compilation, like a best of eerie mm. magazines. Um, I'll probably read some old Alan Moore swamp things. Just kind of the usual, the usual stuff. And I got a handful of, you know, movies that I'll probably, probably be watching too. So, but Good. yeah. Good stuff. All right, Corey, same question to you, man. What, what's on the docket? Um, so I have already consumed a ton of horror stuff, uh, but upcoming, I'm probably going to watch and compare the Clive Barker Books of Blood series that's on Hulu. Um, 2020 series, the, the books are phenomenal, so I'm hoping the show keeps up with that. Um, Didn't they do a movie a few years ago? Like it, A series. That, a series. I don't know that they did a movie, but I'm pretty sure it was, I'm pretty sure it's a series on Hulu. It could be a movie, but it would be like an anthology movie nonetheless. Okay. Um, yeah. But, Midnight uh, Meat Train? Oh, man. I need to, I haven't watched that in years, but the, the <laughs> book is, the short story is great. The only one thing that I watch every Halloween is probably Shaun of the Dead. Because um, it's just, it's too good as a movie. Uh, but I think, I don't know. I I watched every Hellraiser movie last year. Oh, my um, God. Yeah, even the they, sci-fi originals. Uh, like yes, six yeah. and seven. So oh, I watched, yeah, all the way up through <laughs> ten. I think it is ten. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's more a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, there, there's too many. Um, you can quit after I, one. <laughs> you you know you probably should um, go listen to my. Review. Corey, don't go out like that, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I, I go I backwards watch, and again, uh, they get better if you go backwards. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Do it in reverse chronological order. Um, it only gets better from there. But uh, I, I want to do either like Scream or um, I don't know, one of the other big franchises because I've never really, I don't know, I never really cared about any of the, the slasher films uh, growing up. But there's, you know, listening to like the Straight Chilling Review and like their community talk about stuff like that um it's it's no different than like listening to people talk about like godzilla films you know monster movies we're like yeah i know it sucks but hear me out like <laughs> it's still good um so i want to pick one of those franchises you know probably not for review just to watch to say that i did it and be like yeah, okay like this is what you know friday the 13th has to offer this is what you know scream ha or not scream but uh halloween has to offer but and read a few more horror manga titles. So, I like that lineup. Um, as you guys know, for me, uh, when it comes to the spooky season, my limit is normally like the Treehouse of the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror <laughs> Marathon. Mm -hmm. I noticed on FX they've started. Um, they've already started. It was on uh, yesterday all day. So I watched 
a good bit of them. I think Treehouse Horror Five from season six is still my favorite. You get uh you get to see Homer go crazy. You get to see Homer fuck up time and space searching for a donut, and you get to see one of the like legit creepiest things I've ever seen on an animated TV show. Uh, the fog that turns people inside out. That is on that same Treehouse of Horror episode. They even have that well. catchy song. <laughs> yeah, is that the song fog and dance at the end. People inside out. To see it again on TV, I was like, <laughs> yeah, damn, this is fucked up. I like the donut machine in hell. I don't know which episode that is, but they're like feeding them donuts in hell. So more. you like donuts, huh? More, more. And they like run Classic. out of donuts. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm here for the Treehouse of Horror uh, marathon. I kind of want to, I might try to watch it from, you know, the first one all the way up to the current one. I, I know I'm missing some of them in the more recent season. So that might be my goal. And then uh, so a comic series that's on my radar for the spooky season is a title or a series called Refrigerator Full of Heads. And if you guys recall, I think earlier this year it was, I championed the series um, Basket Full of Heads. Well, this is the sequel. So you will go from a basket full of heads to oh, a refrigerator full of heads. Okay, all right. <laughs> Moving on up. Walk-in cooler full of heads. So this is a, so this is a sequel to Joe Hill's Basket Full of Heads. Um, it, it, it came out through DC Comics' uh, Black Label, the Hill House Comics imprint, so more on their horror, kind of scary story side. Um, and it was six issues, and it's all done. I, I don't know how the hell I missed it, but it looks like a, a new writer hopped onto it and a new artist, a new creative team overall. Uh, so that'll be on my radar. That's what I'm going to read. But with that being said, I think we've told enough scary stories for this episode, and I'm running out of clean underwear. Gross. So let's put... A bloody bow on this segment. Bloody to... underwear bow? Yeah. No. <laughs> Corey, this is a family show. Yeah, right? it's too far, bro. I knew you knew. Too far. Here. Now we're going to go ahead and take a quick music break to stretch our legs. But after that, we got one email to address in our mailbag segment that's coming up. And we got some champion picks to share with all of you that are looking for some new entertainment options to dive into. All of that and more after this quick music break, which is provided to us by DJ Crumbs. Enjoy the music. We'll be right back. Corey, what's your vote on the what to name Ashley's kid? Did you vote yet? Good question. Oh man, I, I haven't voted, but I think it was going to be um, like Kite Man. You know? <laughs> oh, Kite Something Man! Cool. Kite Man. I kind of like that. <laughs> well, well, does he start off as as Kite Man or Kite Boy, and then works his way into Kite Man? Oh. Yeah, Kite Kite Boy, Kite Kid, into Kite Boy, into Kite Man. Kite Kid. Oh, <laughs> Kite Kid is adorable. Oh, that's really cute. Stay away from that third cave. <laughs> but you're good. <laughs> good stuff. And a good transition to welcome our listeners back from music break. The music you just heard was by our good friend DJ Crumbs. You know I got a link to more of his music in the uh, show notes, so give that a tap. Follow our guy on Instagram. Thanks again, DJ Crumbs, for the music. All right. For this next segment, we've got one piece of fan mail to read today. It was sent to us by our boy Trey Namo. All right, he wants to talk about New York Comic Con, which will be interesting considering that we are Ooh. recording this episode the week before New York Comic Con and it won't be released until after New York Comic Con. Hmm. So our timeline is all types of, of fucked up. All right, it's a little off to say the least. I'm confident that we can predict the future better than Miss Cleo. So let's go and get into this email, which I should have had prepared and pulled up earlier. But here we are. <laughs> all right. Oh, oh, did we get another one, too? Oh, last no, we minute. Didn't. No, 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 we didn't. <laughs> that was a bill collector. Someone okay, you know go. is chatterbaiting. <laughs> oh. All right. Trey's email goes, New York Comic Con and Amazon Prime Comic Book News is the title. Then he writes, with spooky season upon us, I'm going to try and scare Botter. Please read in a spooky tone. Okay. All right. All right. I got you, Trey. Hold oh, on. Hold on. I, got, I, got the, I got the effects all up. All right, here we go. Ready? Batman is better than Iron Man. DC McFarlane toys are a thousand times better than Marvel Legends. Crisis on Infinite Earths, ha, is better than Secret Wars. 
Now that bot are scared, I got two <laughs> little highlights I'd love to hear y'all's take on. First, I'd love to hear what you guys are looking forward to with New York Comic Con 2022 happening October 6th through 9th. Personally, I'm looking forward to all of the exclusive comic books dropping at the con. And I'm also looking forward to Cowabunga Comics representing North Florida live at the con for all four days. Check out Kyle Willis and Jesse at Booth 3623. There's also some exclusive Kyle Willis New York Comic Cons dropping at the con as well. Uh, The email continues. And to jump on Ashley's champion on Paper Girls, I'd also love to hear... uh, I'd also love to hear your thoughts on Amazon purchasing other comic book series and optioning them into TV series slash movies. I know 8 Billion Genies is a great example of a new killer image book blowing up due to Amazon purchasing the rights to option it. Currently, a raw issue number one cost an easy $60 for a book that came out in May of this year, and its CGC 9.8 is going for $200 plus and climbing. Currently, there's no news on it or if or when they're going to make said series into a show or movie. As always, keep it geeky, Trey Namo. Thank you so much for that. I need to sell my copy. You have a copy of it? Mm-hmm. Eight Billion Genius? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's like, do you sell it for 60 bucks easy or do you go through the process of getting it CGC certified and, you know, to see how good a shape it is. That's, mm. a, that's worth it. I'll take a look at it for you if you want. Mm. You might not get it back, though. Ah, <laughs> uh, that is scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First and foremost, have, has anyone ever been to New York Comic Con? All right. Everyone's shaking their heads. No. New York Comic Con is on my bucket list. I think even before San Diego Comic Con, I want to go to New York Comic Con because to me that is like the like the emphasis on comic book con for the like the major ones, right? I always feel like you get a lot of really good. The focus usually on like comic book series announcements, you know, creative teams forming, um, and stuff like you still get like you know movie and show announcements, but not as much I think as like San Diego Comic Con. So let's gonna break down this first uh, this email and his two questions. His first one was, uh, he'd love to hear what you what we're looking forward to with New York Comic Con happening um, next weekend, obviously. Uh, did anyone take a look at that link I sent with all the upcoming things? Did anything stick out to anyone? So that Super Mario thing is real? <laughs> I think so. They're saying that the first trailer for that Super Mario movie starring Chris Pat, Pratt, Chris I'm sorry. Pratt. Chris be Pratt is Mario. On October 6th. So here in a where, couple days. Where's right? the outrage? He's not Italian. Oh, there was outrage uh, when they first made the announcement. Oh, I didn't see it. I think a lot. There's like a lot of casting for that movie that people were like, "What the fuck?" I'm doubting Mario's Italian (laughs) heritage. (laughs) You better not have an accent when that trailer comes (laughs) out. (laughs) Is he gonna talk like that all the time? It's me. Okay, I I pulled up the casting because I I forgot about it. Is he getting fat again? Like when he was in uh, that show, Parks and Rec. <laughs> I love Anna fat Taylor Chris Pratt. Joy as Prince. Oh, this is wild. So you got Anna, Anna Taylor Joy as Princess Peach, Charlie Day as Luigi. Uh, no Seth way. R- Seth funny. Rogen as Donkey Kong, Jack Black as Bowser, Keegan Michael Key as Toad. It's kind of like one of them all star lineup kind of movies. That's pretty. And it's not. Lineup. Is it animated? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I'm assuming so. It doesn't say anything about it being live action as far as okay. I'm But that was on yeah, my list God. too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can be the one like in the 90s like with Dennis Hopper in it. They'll just give Chris Pratt a uh, porn stash and <laughs> <laughs> I think Jack Black could be Bowser without any makeup yeah. or anything. <laughs> He just, just wears one hair. of those backpacks, those like Koopa shell backpacks with the spikes. <laughs> yeah, Koopa shell backpack and a thong and we are good to go. <laughs> Actually, I'm surprised you didn't mention the the Doom Patrol and Titans. They're, I think we're probably getting new trailers, at least more info on the new seasons. I know you were a fan of Doom Patrol, and you're going to be watching Titans for your boy, um, uh, um, uh, Chris Welliver. Titus. Titus, Titus Welliver. Sorry, yeah, Titus Welliver. <laughs> um, I I think Doom Patrol is like so underrated. It, it is really such is. a good show. Have you guys been hearing all this like Brendan Fraser news, like about mm-hmm. his new movie? And they're like, oh, he's stepping back into Hollywood. I'm like, no, he's been doing Doom Patrol and it's really good, but no one's watching it. I like that Ashley's approaching this from like a hipster standpoint of like, you guys are only just now finding about Brandon Fraser's return. Yeah. You've been on it. You're not hot anymore. Do Doom Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> You're fat and weird looking now. Don't just dis- Hey, I'm boy. fat and weird looking. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Before, before yeah, anyone you gets it. upset. No, you, got it. you got it, Ed. My bad. He's on it's my like, team if now. If nobody got me, Brendan Fraser got he's me. He's on my team now. He's, he's, he's on my team. I overstepped. My bad. My bad. <laughs> All right. 
What else do we got? Well, well, real quick, was there any other New York Comic Con news anyone was excited about or looking forward so to? So, oh, de- like the Doom Patrol thing, she did cover um, for actually announced things. Uh, I am excited about Weird. Um, mm. I am so oh, hyped. It's the, the Weird Al mockumentary. Um, yeah, yeah, that's going to be tight. Yeah. That's with, uh, what's his name? Harry Potter? Or not Harry Potter? Yeah. No, Harry the, Potter? Um, Daniel Radcliffe. Uh, yeah, Daniel Radcliffe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I am super hyped for that. Uh, like Weird Al is um, like one of my Evan favorite Rachel Wood is Madonna. That's pretty wild. Oh, geez. <laughs> There's a, I listened to a really good Weird Al um, podcast interview on the Quest Love Supreme podcast. And it was awesome to hear Quest Love be such a huge fan of Weird Al. And Weird Al being <laughs> uh, like, I guess surprisingly for me, very normal. Just like a super bright, mm-hmm. chill dude. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this movie too. I want to say unannounced because it is NYCC and this is the only one that does anime like SDCC doesn't do anime. Um, But a marriage of like the two different things that we like, I would love to hear any kind of update on the Brian K. Vaughn Gundam movie. Anything that was mentioned that Brian K. Vaughn was picked up to do. And I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be. Well, I don't know if it's live action or um, like CG, but first Brian K. Vaughn up, being... First thing that popped up is Netflix making live action Gundam movie. Yes. So because this is Sunrise announcing a live action Gundam or teasing, teasing was like years and years ago. And then they slapped Brian K. Vaughn. And it's like this. I think this will be great. Like, you know, Brian K. Vaughn has a history. I am maintaining my composure. For the show, which is unusual, <laughs> considering what I normally behave like on the show. But this makes me super fucking excited that Brian K. Vaughn is attached wild. to Gundam. That's fucking great. How much money does this guy yeah. need? <laughs> Jesus. All of it. Obviously, how, how many enough. yen? How many Good yen? Lord. Take it. All right, Ed, what about you, man? Um, well, I remember mentioning a little while ago that we were promised something from the Todd father himself oh. about the Spawn movie. He well, promised yeah. New York Comic Con we are getting something in an interview. Um, so that I'm kind of curious about. A couple other things. Um, there's a panel they are renewing uh, or doing a season two of the Legend of Vox Machina, which I really liked. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was a really good animation. I'm not even familiar with the with the podcast at all, but I have some coworkers who basically that's how they get through the days. Just listen to these hours and hours of campaigning they do <laughs> and they are doing a anime or disney plus is going to do an animated um american born chinese by gene oh luen yang, yang. Yeah. um so i'm kind of interested in seeing what that's going to look like and how that's going to be taken because it's like i said there's a pretty crazy asian you know stereotype as one of the characters and i'm going to see how that plays out to you know the Twitterverse and stuff, how people are going to react to that. I'm kind of, I like the story a lot. I thought it's a really you know it's an award winning graphic novel. So I'm curious to seeing that. I'm feeling good about our our predictions. Just in recap, we've got uh, Super Mario trailer probably um, going to be met with a lot of uh, interesting <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, re- fan reaction. I think we're all betting on a terrible um, Chris Pratt porn stash. Maybe we'll get the oh. same kind of thing to happen. Uh, maybe the same thing will happen. With the Sonic movie, where it was like fan outrage gave uh, Sonic some brand new dentures. I'm not mad at Anya Taylor Joy as Princess Peach. Not though. at all. Uh, we've got uh, on, on the docket on our bingo card uh, announcement from uh, about the Gundam series that Brian K. Vaughn is on. And last but not least, I guess um, uh, on the bingo card, you know, hardest hardest square to try to get is you know the Todd McFarlane Spawn movie update. I guess we'll see. We'll see if we're lucky. I want Jamie Foxx to come in dressed up as Spawn. <laughs> With chains just chains. beating people. <laughs> 100-foot cape. <laughs> Trey, thanks for that email. That is all we've got as far as our uh, fan mail, our mailbag segment. But before I forget, I do have an announcement for our Jax homies. I won't even hit you guys with the megaphone sound effect. Just listen up. Uh, this is for anyone that lives in Jax or for anyone that's been asking about us doing another live show. I want to encourage you guys to come check us out at the Jax Duval Comic and Zine event. Me and Ed will be there. Uh, it is scheduled for October 22nd at the Jacksville Main Public Library downtown. The guest of honor will be none other than the renowned comic book artist, zine lover, illustrator, 
and designer Jim Rugg, who is a friend of the show that we've had on the show twice now. And I'm going to be lucky enough to be hosting his panel. I'm going to try to record that panel and release it as an episode. Look, you got Ed there. You got me there. You got you got Jim Rugg there. You're going to have a bunch of amazing um, uh, independent creators and, and you know comic makers there as well. The Duval Comics and Zine Festival. It's, it's run by an incredible group of people, all right? They're all dedicated to promoting independent print and publishing. So if you're someone that dabbles in or is interested in making your own zines and mini comics, or you just want to meet awesome independent comic creators, like I said, this event is for you. They're going to have workshops there. They're going to do some printing as well as zine and comic shop. You can also zine and comic shop, I'm sorry. Um, and it's free to all. The best part is that it's a free event. So come say hi to me and Ed. Come have a good day uh, talking comics and, and, you know, meeting independent creators. Um, once again, taking place, Maine, Jacksonville Public Library, downtown, Saturday, October 22nd from 12 to 5 p.m. I'm going to have the link in the bio for more tickets. While you do that, it's a perfect time to get into our last topic of the show and tell you about the best entertainment options worthy of your time, personally backed by us it's time for champion season. It's time, it's time for, for champion, champion season. season. Champion, champion, champion season is the part of the show where we highlight other worthwhile entertainment options like movies, TV series, books, video games, and anything else that we'd personally recommend to our friends. Uh, Corey, guest of honor privileges. Will you go ahead and, and take us away first? What are you going to champion today? All right. Um, so I'll do I'll do three quick things. The first one I'll make the most relevant. Uh, it is spooky season and probably the most expensive comic collection comic thing that I purchase is the hardback uh, larger version of A Walk Through Hell by Garth Ennis. Um, that is, yeah, it is absolutely creepy. It, it is probably the best. Uh, American example that I can think off off the dome um, that is that very like sick and twisted. Um, I don't know, like there's a lot of Hellraiser imagery in it. Um, and it is another like very sad story. There's some weird stuff that happens uh, if you've ever read the first issue. Um, if you like the first issue, you will like the rest of it. But if you're a botter, you will not. <laughs> <laughs> These covers are trippy. I'm going through uh, Google Images now. And it's and, and it's an aftershock comic. That's cool. Yeah. So second, super quick, I've been reading through during the storm. It's a fun, it is a much more lighthearted manga. Um, but Doro Hedoro, they have an anime on Netflix one season. It's 23 volumes of manga. Um, it is a ton of fun. Uh like it's seinen, so there's gonna be like a little bit of nudity. There's a lot of bit of violence in it. Um but it's just so enjoyable. Um, characters dressed up in masks and stuff. It's about a guy whose head gets turned into a lizard and he's trying to figure that that out. But it's this fun romp, almost like a cowboy bebop level of just like the main story is going on, but sort of no one gives a shit. Um, there's just, you know, there's like a spooky sorcerer's ball and uh, a zombie hunting night. It, it's almost like an anthology with a main story underlying um and then lastly it is horror season so go read clive barker's books of blood they're so much fun books of blood and fun never thought i'd hear that i like <laughs> yeah. it. good stuff Corey. thank you ashley you get the baton next what are you gonna champion okay i have two and i don't think they could be any more different from each other um so the first one is the dahmer series on netflix oh jeez, um, of course <laughs> White girls and serial it's killers. Ten oh. episodes. Ten whole episodes. They're like 45 minutes long each. I don't know. It's just interesting. Like, I think I watched six of them in one day during the hurricane. Oh, no. That's not good. Um, They they just did a really good job. Like, uh, I forget that guy's Evan Peters, I think. Mm -hmm. Man, he's freaking creepy. Like, he, he does the part well. Um, and it's really like there's a lot of of facts in there. Of course, some of the stuff you're watching and you're like, there's no way that that's how it happened. But um, I think just overall, like there's a lot of information. Then you get to see like after they have all the episodes of like the horrible stuff he did, you get to see like um, how it affected everybody around him. Um, so I think just like as a whole, it was just really interesting series. And then my other one is an Instagram account of uh, for monkey cat luna 
and it is a cat. <laughs> Here we go. Me and Ed. All her videos. Grab phones. It's a cat eating treats, and she like scrunches her nose and just does like cat ASMR into like a <laughs> microphone. And literally, like, if I I've had so many stressful days at work. Well, I will just sit in my car and just watch these videos until like my blood pressure goes down. It's Aww. just like just so nice to have like something like self-soothing on your phone <laughs> <laughs> where you know that like as agitated as you are, you can just sit down and just watch this cat and just like relax before you have to go back to work. You were right. Those are completely <laughs> opposite sides of the coin. That sounds like an instant Well, father. there's Dahmer eats people. The cat <laughs> eats stuff on my Yeah, eats treats. Yeah. Yeah. And you make treats. magic happen sometimes. That's fair. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you, Ashley. I'm glad it wasn't the Jeffrey Dahmer AMS. <laughs> 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 that sounds like a good YouTube idea. Or a good SNL skit. <laughs> yeah, take us away. What you got? All right. This came out a few months ago, but they released a book to go with the uh, Botter's t-shirt. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, wow, Sandra. <laughs> Jim Lee's uh, legendary card set, which impacted any 90s kids who was in the comics. Um, they did a book basically telling the, whoa, something <laughs> happened in the next room. I, I, think the mics, touchdown. I think the mics might have picked up <laughs> life cheering. <laughs> right now. Go Jags, baby! <laughs> <laughs> but, go ahead, Ed. But, but it goes over the history of the uh, the cards, how they came to be, because this is when Marvel is just really into really into cards. So you get to see all hundred cards front and back. I wish the book was a little bigger, and they even have a little poster on the Bro, uh, dust cover. What oh, the man. fuck? This is. <laughs> Do you know how many times I've seen this book at Gotham and I've just passed it up? Like, I don't need this book. I don't I don't need this book. You still I need don't. this fucking book. No, but... I still do. I, I do. I do. I was it's wrong. awesome because like I still have the card set from when I was a kid. I still have probably one and a half sets left, even the hologram cards. Um, but it's it's really cool because this is I think with these cards, and this is hot off the heels of him being the you know, selling what, nine million copies of X Men One. I think 92 or 93 so he is marvel's golden child but i think doing this card set because this card set was everywhere these were in like walmarts and targets and stuff so this i think really put it onto a whole new level and the funny thing is too it also comes with a little set of cards dude all right i need the book all right enough <laughs> I need, you even get cards in it and like i said it's and the funny thing is this is like him doing a full comic load and then trying to do these in free time so these are essentially sketches that just shows you how good jim lee is because these are basically not too much bigger than the actual card they have some of the original art i wish they put all the original uh art on board on the uh on the bristol but there is a you can find it there is a website that has all the original art if you ever care to see it but i kind of like the process stuff you see a little bit of it but i wish there was a little more but uh, yeah, if you are a fan, if you are a Jim Lee fan, if you if you were a kid in that era collecting comics, it's a really cool coffee table book to have. That's rad. Sold. I am sold. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna keep mine uh, short and sweet, but I'm gonna keep it Jack's focused. All right, I'm, I'm feeling good about about our hometown. So both of these are pretty. One is Jack centric for sure. The other one, uh, not so not so much sort of. The first one I'm gonna champion is the Black Hive Tattoo Pain of Process Art Show. Our guy, Nick Wagner, owner and head honcho of Black Hive Tattoo Shop. You guys have heard his name plenty of times if you've listened to the show for a couple of years now. He was a, a, he's a longtime supporter, longtime friend of the show. Uh, but his tattoo shop held an art show, uh, and the opening was earlier uh, this week. Um, it was selected new works by all of the artists at Black Hive Tattoo. Um, I think there's close to five of them, and, and I wish I would have wrote down the names. But if you go to Black Hive Tattoo's uh, a website, they've got a portfolio for each one. I, I think oftentimes the artistic capabilities of a tattoo artist, um, I don't think they get enough like credit. You know, especially I think in a fine art gallery of world. Good tattoo artists. Yeah. I should say. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said black hive tattoo. I think oh, already yeah, off the bat. All, but you know, just the bars. So. Gotcha. Fair enough. So I, I think a lot of times, like you think fine art world and, and you know, a gallery setting. I don't think a tattoo artist or tattoo art uh, comes to mind, but 
you know, between Nick Wagner and, and our, you know, good friend, uh, um, Dustin Harewood, they were able to, you know, come together, come up with an idea for this art show. And it was awesome. Like original artwork by all of the artists at Black Hive Tattoo were on display. Uh, Nick Wagner's work was up there and framed in some killer stuff. I posted some of it on my Instagram. And I mean, it ranged from like, you know, things that you would expect very like hard line, edgy, like, you know, uh, I guess a- animal kind of uh, illustrations to like, watercolors and paintings and you know line art i mean it was it was excellent it was such a diverse show and diverse body of work being presented i'm not really doing any justice trying to describe it because you just got to see it for yourself i mean if you've seen nick wagner's artwork it's like a blend of a lot of things you know he's got a lot of themes and elements but fantastic art show if you live in jacks i highly encourage you go check it out for yourself i mean it's maybe taking an hour at the most you could probably you know see it all in 30 minutes but um, yeah, really refreshing art show. So big shout out to Nick Wagner and the entire Black Hive tattoo crew. And the other thing I'll champion is, you know, showing some more love to uh, to Jax. This is more so for audio creators, fellow podcasters. And that is, um, I'm a champion the straight chilling in uh, Simpsons is greater than crossover episode that um, by the time this episode comes out, that their episode will have come out. But every year, I think for the last two, three years now, mm-hmm. they've done a Treehouse of Horror episode. Uh, together, so they invite our, you know, our guy Warren, aka Bar of Darkness, onto the Straight Chillin' Show to talk about a Treehouse of Horror episode, and it's a lot of fun hearing them too. You know, not only do I personally know both camps, I know Warren, I know Robbie, I know the Straight Chillin' crew, but you know, I respect both of their podcasts, and when they come together, it's like it is fantastic. You know, like I'm really proud of seeing two excellent podcasts come together and the fact that they're both from you know the hometown i mean come on you know that's an easy champion so if you're looking for more podcasts to listen to give that a listen so once again my champions black hive tattoo pain of process art show at the kent gallery at kent campus fscj and the straight chilling treehouse of horror uh episode with uh simpsons is greater than podcast check those out shortbox nation it's now your turn to chime in if you got a killer champion that we should check out share it with us or tell us if you try out any of the recommendations that we shared today. I know we tossed a lot of recommendations at you. Um, if you try one or two or all of them, let us know. We'd love to get some feedback on it, right? Hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, or email. Ashley, it's your favorite time of the show. It's time to wrap this shit up before we officially uh, sign, seal, deliver, and call it a day. Would you mind doing the honors? Uh, can you give us some parting words, uh, maybe some you know lessons learned, or uh, anything? What you got for us? So... This episode, we all had our picks and we talked a lot about like supernatural, scary creatures, um, body horror and zombies and stuff like that. But I think that Corey really taught us that there's nothing scarier than the pain and despair that comes with raising a child. (laughs) (laughs) So that's my takeaway for this episode. Ashley, you learn so much from these shows, don't you? That was good. (laughs) That was so good. Caught me by surprise. That's only if you push your nephew off a cliff. <laughs> and you know what? Sometimes a nephew needs a good pushing off Sometimes. a cliff, right? You know, to learn the lesson. Sometimes you can't help it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> he tripped over my foot. <laughs> Corey, I do want to say, well, on the topic uh, of the excellent uh, Corey Torgerson as a co-host today, I do want to say thank you so much for joining us, Corey. It's a pleasure seeing you. I'm glad to hear that, um, you know, you ended up being safe and all with the, with the hurricane. And... um and and you know what I'm I'm feeling I'm feeling very friendly today so I want you to go ahead and give a plug for the world is my podcast. Let's know what you got going what? on, brother. World is my <laughs> no, I'm sorry. The world is my burrito. Sorry, sorry. There we go. There we go. No, Bonner, Yeah, I, uh, I do want to say thanks to you for the. Podcast. The world is <laughs> that, my that's, podcast. That is, that's the name of my memoir book. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's oh, I bad. feel like that would be the name of Randy Newman's podcast, <laughs> since all he does is just say whatever is currently happening. Um. Anyways. <laughs> So I do want to say thanks for the invite, uh, especially like horror of all things. I love talking. Um, you know, this is it's a great crossover thing. Uh, but if you want to listen to more of The World is My Burrito, um, you can search The World is My Burrito or Twimby. That's T-W-I-M-B um, on any podcatcher of your choice. You can find me on social media, though I am most active on Twitter at Twimby Podcast. Um, yeah, it'll, the next couple of episodes will most likely be spooky, probably even leading into Christmas because like, I, I have nothing to say about Christmas except Krampus talk, which is more horror. Come yeah. On. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, keep it but going. yeah, thanks again. And uh, hopefully someone actually enjoys what I read and it doesn't down them and depress them. And, uh, you know, always look on the bright side of life, guys. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's <laughs> Randy Newman callback. <laughs> no, no, that's uh, Monty Python. Yeah. Life's a piece of shit when you look at it. <laughs> All right, well, there you have it, Short Box Nation. Thank you so much for hanging out with us this week. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a little favor, all right, and help spread the word to a friend or someone you know that loves comics as much as we do. And if you're feeling extra generous, consider leaving us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Now, next week, Zach Armour from the Comic Adventures YouTube channel. We had him on the show uh, was it last year or the week, or year before? Whenever we did our Suicide Squad Spotlight episode, he was our special guest co-host then. He will be joining us again for a special Spotlight episode dedicated to Black Adam. We'll be reading the 2007 series. Well, actually, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll see what, what the Patreon is looking like. But it's looking like right now we're going to be reading the 2007 comic book series, The Dark Age, in celebration and anticipation of the movie starring Dwayne Rock Johnson coming out next week. Now, if you're a Patreon subscriber... You know, I know we're talking about Halloween this whole entire episode, but Christmas came early for all of you. We're going to aim to give you not one, but two bonus episodes this month. The first one is going to be a new installment of our Pilots License series. And the other bonus show will be a previous wishlist episode with Drew. You got that to look forward to. And if you're not a Patreon subscriber and you're like, what the fuck is going on? Bonus episodes? Where do I get those at? Where the hell have you been this entire time? Join our Patreon community, all right? Especially if you want short box content. To hold you over in between regular episodes, become a member of our Patreon community for access to bonus shows, video content, um, merch, sometimes even nudes. Cesar sends those in every now and oh. then. So I mean, yeah, a lot of a lot of good perks. Did you say nudes or news? A little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> New nudes, newer nudes. Click the link in the show notes to get to our Patreon community and level up your fandom. Until we meet again, Short Box Nation. I'm just going to say it. I mean, we're going to see each other but before the, the month is over. I'm going to say happy Halloween ahead of time because why not? It's our spooky episode. Why not? Take care of yourselves. Have a great day. And please continue to make mine and yours short box. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.